This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by ECJ Contacts. Thank you for, for joining us this evening. We, we appreciate it. My name is Darren Joseph, and I'm here with my colleague, Hervé and Hannah, and we're going to be talking Hello? to you about U.S. France tax. So how we'll approach it is, is pretty simple, because I know you guys have lots of questions. You emailed us a lot, a lot of questions. So I'll talk for just like really quickly 15 minutes on, on U.S. tax principles. Everybody's going to talk for 15, 20 minutes as well. And then we jump straight into the Q&A. We will go through the questions that were pre-submitted first and then time allowing for the rest of the hour. Then we'll take questions from you guys. If you have questions in the chat box, if you're looking at us from Zoom, the, the chat box below, you can type your questions there. If you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, you can type your questions under the live stream. And without further ado, I will share my screen. All right, great. So um, my, as I mentioned, my name is Darren and I run a semi-autonomous team doing in US international tax within a, a larger practice called Moore's Roland. Uh, Moore's Roland, we have uh, 30 offices in, in 13 countries. I'm actually based in Singapore. I've been based in, in Singapore for coming on eight years. Uh, this, this is who I am, and because I am U.S. qualified, I am required to say that nothing we share here today should be construed as advice. Please treat it as an education piece. Uh, what we hope to do is equip you with the general principles that you would need to engage with your own chosen tax professional. But for those who think, you know, I'm going to come here with pen and paper, and I'm going to figure out how to do everything on my own, I'm going to be an expert at the end of one hour, impossible impossible and as for the terms of my license nothing i say here say here today should be construed as encouraging you to pay less than your fair share of tax in any jurisdiction in which you are exposed and please bear in mind that we are recording this and it'll be available on our website afterwards so if you do not want your image to be captured please switch off your camera and um, disclaimer so for those who don't think that the long arms of the IRS reach outside of the U.S., uh, I always use these two guys as a case study. One of them used to be my, not friend, but one of my connections on Facebook. He no longer is because after he was detained by the U.S. government and did some time in jail, he never came back onto Facebook. But they, we, we can talk about it if it's of interest, but the point is that the IRS is not afraid to reach out outside of uh, the continental US if there are tax issues. And I'll just jump straight into it. As we all know, the United States practices citizenship-based taxation. Now, most OECD countries, including France, taxes on your worldwide income. But what makes the US, I think, unique is that even though you are no longer in the US, then you're still required to file and pay taxes. No matter how long you stay out of the US, you're still required to file and pay taxes. And we'll drill down into that later on as well. So it's no matter how long, and there's so many misunderstandings around this, like if I earn less than the foreign earned income exclusion of 107,000 it is this year, then I don't need to file and pay taxes. That's all wrong. We will take a deeper dive into that later on. It's, people ask me the question all the time, well, you know, I'm outside the U.S., I'm living in France. How is the IRS going to know what I'm doing? Come on, how are they going to figure it out? This is the answer, FATCA. So, the, so FATCA is not a tax, which is contrary to some popular misconceptions online. It is a framework for information exchange. So what it does, it has empowered the U.S. government to sign a treaty with France. And France has now obligated all its domestic financial institutions to go through their account holders and identify anyone that they deem or they suspect of being US and report them accordingly. Now, that, that's, this is important, an important point because I'm sure many of you, just like me, you have more than one passport. So you rock up into a financial institution, brokerage house, whatever, they ask you, what is your nationality? You show them the other passport, whatever that is. 
by law, they're required to still look for certain indicators that you may be US exposed. And if you deny it, they, by law, are supposed to highlight you as a recalcitrant account holder. That's a special designation. They don't have to tell you. They just flag you and they send your details to the IRS anyway. Because from their point of view, it's better to report someone who is not than to miss someone because then they get in trouble if they miss anyone who may have been US exposed. No one wants a repeat of what happened in, in Switzerland. So their default is if in doubt, report them. So please bear that in mind. That's how they find out. In terms of a US person, I think everybody gets that if you're a US citizen or a green card holder, but what some people miss is under section 7701, there's a category for substantial presence, which really was a big deal in 2020. There are many people who are French citizens, they have, they're not US citizens, they're not green card holders, but because of the travel disruptions, they were unable to return, they were unable to leave the US and they spend way more time than they intended to. Under, yeah, that, and not just French nationals, people from all over the world were unable to leave the US and they may have inadvertently triggered substantial presence. So something to keep in mind. Accidental Americans, again, this is something we, we you know, I think it was a thing ever since the, after the aftermath of the Second World War, where you've had US servicemen uh, in, in Europe for the first time. So if you have one US parent, and one, let's say a French parent, and you have a child from that union, under certain circumstances, that child is a US citizen. That, that is regardless of whether you registered the birth with the US embassy, you didn't get a social, you didn't get a, a passport, it doesn't matter, that is a US person who will be subject to taxes later on. And then we can talk about the section 6013G election if it's of interest. Under certain circumstances, you may want to elect your, that your French spouse, your non-US spouse, be treated as American on your tax returns. It, it's a strategic move and some people use it to their advantage, uh, not just from tax planning, it could work for you, but if you intend at some point to get a green card, it's something to consider. So we can talk about that later on if there is an interest. So responsibilities of US persons now that we have defined who they are. Uh, well, I think it goes without saying file and pay taxes, but what people don't get is that when it comes to international tax, the IRS is apparently less concerned with getting money in the door and more concerned with data. Data is what they really want to get. So uh, they want to know, you know, where's your money? Where's your money being stored? Who are you receiving money from? Who are you gifting money to? And the reason why I say that is their real focus is clear given the penalties. So the civil and criminal penalties that are levied for not disclosing information are way out of proportion with you know, the, the low interest rates that you get, uh, you have to deal with if you didn't pay your taxes on time. It is way out of proportion. So it is clear what the IRS's focus is uh, on information. And we'll get into that uh, a, a bit further on. Uh, probably in the next slide, uh, yeah, this slide. So this is an acronym that I've created for those who are US exposed and live outside of the US. It's just a really cool way, I think, of remembering what your responsibilities are. So do your best, you must do your best. B, bank accounts. And when I say bank accounts, I don't just mean regular bank accounts, but all financial accounts some of which may be in insurance policy, some of which may be in French pensions. It may be brokerage accounts. You may have shares in French companies. Any sort of financial asset, the IRS wants to know about that. That is way important. Remember I said information, right? E stands for estimated taxes. Well, obviously, if you were in the US and you got paid on a W-2, then there's withholding, right? So the IRS is getting the money along the way. If you outside of the US, that's not going to happen, right? So the IRS does not like to wait until the following year to then get like April 15th of 2021 to get taxes due from earnings in 2020. They want to get it along the way. So you need to work with your tax team or with your software or whatever to figure out what your estimated tax liability would be to the US in advance and make them in at least four quarterly installments. Failure to do that would lead to you have to fill out a form 2210 
which is where you calculate your underpayment penalties. And the penalties, depending on how much you earn, could be a lot. So it really depends. State tax issues. Do your best as stands for state. 50 different states, 50 different rules. Understand that most states are domicile states. What does that mean? It means that even though you live, you've been living in France for a considerable period of time, you may still be taxable back in your, your, your home state depending on what the situation is. So it's worth having a conversation with someone to make sure that you know, you're not uh, incurring or accruing any liabilities then. And some people say, well, I live in France, I don't care. We've had many cases where people at some point in time you go back home and, you, and then you don't know that they've state franchise tax boards. They talk to the federal government, they talk to their, so they know exactly what's going on with you. And when you do come back, they have a nice tall bill waiting for you. And we've had to deal with that for, for many clients. So please make sure that you're properly severed uh, connections with states. And it's be gonna become an even bigger issue for those who are connected to California or any of the other states that may be planning a wealth tax. So again, just keep that in mind. T stands for transfer taxes. Uh, again, this, this is an area that's often not well understood because all the other taxes, you can kind of look at the, the Inland Revenue Tax Code, you can look at the, the code and see, you know, what is what. But when it comes to transfer taxes, that is reliant on the concept of domicile. And it, we rely more on case law and looking at the way the courts interpret it as opposed to tax code. So the, the point is that you're living outside of the US, you, you get in relationships or whatever, and you receive gifts and you give gifts. Understand to, to non-US spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever the case may be, there may be tax implications to that in terms of reporting. Remember we said the IRS is all about data. Data is a new goal, it's new oil, right? They want data, they wanna know what you're doing with your funds coming and going. And failure to report that may lead to a penalty that could be as much as 30% of the unreported gift. And then, of course, uh, sorry, I don't mean to be morbid, but, you know, it's a thing we need to think about, which is your estate taxes. And I say that because a part of our practice is dealing with non-U.S. widows, non-U.S. widowers who have to untangle a web of unfinished business with their former, you know, their recently departed US spouses. So some tax planning could go a long way to taking care of your family in the unfortunate and sad event that you do pass on. So it's morbid, but we have to mention it anyway. I'm gonna to touch on stimulus payments because of course it's, it's a thing right now. So I think most people would be familiar with this slide and who qualifies for a stimulus payment. There have been two rounds. Well, well, there were two rounds last year, one around summertime and the other one late December. And there's a third round as of last weekend, last week. I think last weekend was signed. So the most, the more recent round is, the, the third round is the most generous. But for those who did not get anything in the first two rounds. It's, you know, there's still hope. There's something called a recovery rebate credit. What does that mean? It's a refundable credit. So if it is when you're doing your taxes for 2020 and you have a tax liability, it will be reduced by the amount of the, the this rebate credit. And if you are owed a refund, it will be increased by the amount of, of the credit. Most of many of our clients are higher income earners, so they like they email me and WhatsApp me when anytime there's something to do with a stimulus payment, like where's my money? One of the most common reasons for not getting any of the payments is you're a victim of your own success, you earn too much. So please pay attention to the phase outs. Uh, when you earn above a certain uh, income level, the amount you get gradually decreases until it completely disappears. The third one, as we mentioned, it is, it is quite generous uh, and it does include uh, spa partners with potentially with items and, 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 and things like that. For those who are married to, to non-US nationals, uh, please bear in mind that the IRS is in a complete mess right now. 
uh, and the back, I mean, it was always a difficult agency to deal with, but with COVID-19 and the shutdowns last year, and when they had to reopen, it was with social distancing and whatever in the offices. The bottom line is that if you have paper filing returns, there is a backlog. Things got lost. Things are not being processed. We've had no end of complaints from our clients. So if you've had issues with 2019, you're not alone. A lot of people have. So the key takeaway I want you guys to, to, you know, to walk away with is e-file, e-file, e-file. You want to try to e-file as much as possible. That's when you know it's going to get processed. Chances are very low that it gets lost or, mis or you know, misplaced or whatever happens in, in the IRS. So please e-file. Make sure your, your chosen tax team can e-file your returns. And if they are not Americans themselves, by law, they cannot the IRS won't give them a license. So you're looking for someone who is uh, a US person as well, then the IRS will give them permission to e-file returns for clients. And um, ask if you do have a spouse that is not American, check to see whether their software can still e-file uh, joint returns or married filing separately returns where a spouse does not have an ITIN. So that, that, that just helps you. For, to, you know, to their credit, let's give credit where credit is due. The IRS's website is pretty comprehensive. So please, if you have any questions about, about the stimulus payments, the FAQs are well, you know, well thought out and it explains everything. If you want to change your details, you can also do that to some extent online. I mentioned early in one of the earlier slides that there have been so much misunderstanding about filing thresholds. This, it changes regularly, so it's always worth paying attention. If you have a look at this, you see the, the threshold for filing a tax return if you file separate, marry filing separately is $5. So if you made more than $5 in 2020, a return is due. So there, there's so much misunderstanding that we, we see and we hear in some of the online forums. Of course, within the last 48 or 72 hours, there's been so much, you know, media storm around President Biden's tax plan. But this is old news. While the campaign was going on last year, his campaign team did re release a comprehensive tax plan. It's probably one of the more comprehensive, of, you know, or tax professionals, not just me, but many of us have ever seen. Uh, so nothing has come as a surprise because... We knew this since last year. But remember, this is just his proposal. Once it gets to Congress, there'll be negotiations in both the, the Senate and the House. So this is just like the starting position. Uh, I think in terms, I, as I mentioned, it's pretty comprehensive. It'll take hours to go through it, but just to call out some of the key things for those who reside outside of the US like we do. The cap on social security is proposed to be uh, removed, which means if you make more than 400K, you're gonna be facing some extra taxes. So it, these are designed to target whom they believe to be the higher income earners. For those who have corporate structures, uh, entrepreneurs, business owners um, uh, who may be listening or maybe watching this, the corporate tax rate is proposed to jump from 21 to 28. So that will just not only affect those with a US structure, but for those who may be impacted by guilty, which is a global intangible low tax income tax. On your foreign structures, guilty is calculated as a percentage of the US corporate income tax. So you may, if it happens, you may see some movement on, on that side as well. Uh, the capital gains rate is proposed to be increased for those making more than a million. And as the step up in basis for those who are engaged in more advanced tax planning, it's going to be revised as well. So these are just some of the things that to look at. Or I also want to call out the last one where the estate and gift tax exemption under President Trump, it was pushed up to 11 million. Uh, President Biden proposes to bring it all the way back down to three. So it really, really expands the net. So. With that in mind, I will hit the pause button and I turn it over to my colleague who will talk about things from the France point of view. Hervé, over to you. <clears throat> so I am uh, Hervé Belov. I am a chartered accountant uh, in the Paris area. Uh, and I have a practice uh, in which we are accustomed to dealing with uh, English speaking clients. 
we serve uh, clients from uh, Australia, the US, New Zealand, and uh, various countries around the world. These countries, these clients can be residents in France or non-residents, and uh, we serve them for uh, their interest in France. So uh, first I wanted to tell you about uh, starting a business in France. There is a World Bank issues a study every year. It is called Doing Business. I am a contributor to the study. It, uh, it studies in which countries it is uh, easier to, to do some business and it compares uh, 190 countries. For uh, the item starting in business, France is considered as uh, the as a rank of uh, 37, which is not so good to my uh, sense. And the quotation is 93.1. Uh, so we have done a lot of efforts to, to make it easier to set up a, an activity in France. Uh, <clears throat> yes, in a, usually to, to get an activity, to, to declare an activity, you get in France what we call a CIRET number. Uh, which is uh, the directory of all uh, of all economic activities in France, and uh, in fact, when you declare your company, your activity, your auto entrepreneur, it it takes less than a week to uh, to get this number, uh, which will be useful for uh, a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> Yes, and uh, in fact, also all activities are open to, uh, to U.S. citizens. We don't make any difference. And as a U.S. citizen, you can have a company, you can manage it, you can do whatever you want. If you want to set up a company, you will have or any activity. You, the main questions you would have to face is, uh, do I wish to be independent? Do I want to, to set up a company? Uh, will I be taxed under corporate tax or the personal income tax? Will my activity be professional or will it be non-professional? And what would be my social status? Will I be self-employed or uh, employed, I would say, with a pay slip and with an employer? It will change a lot, quite a lot of things. Uh, first, I wanted to tell you about uh, the corporate uh, income tax. So in this corporate tax, the taxpayer in the, is the company. Uh, it is based on the net, re, net result. So um, in fact, in all companies, you need accounting books. Um, and uh, you can, then there are some tax credits. The main tax credits are given uh, when you have uh, innov uh, an innovative activity. If you do research or whatsoever, then you can have really huge tax credits uh, to go forward and uh, uh, and and have uh, yes, any innov innovating activity in France. Uh, there are some other tax credits, but which would be difficult to use is when you set up your activity in some poor uh, poor cities of the country. Then you you could get some advantages. The basic rate for uh, corporate tax, it is 15% uh, up to a net result of uh, 38,120 euros a year, so for 12 months. And uh, then if you are over this net result, the taxation will be on 26.5. That is the rate for 20, 2021. There, is a, there has been a move uh, over, the, over the last years to decrease this rate. The trend is announced to the objective is to go to 25%. This objective is announced for 2022. I'm not sure uh, that uh, the, uh, I can't assure you that in 2022, uh, this, uh, the, this rate uh, won't move. Uh, never forget, if you set up a company which is taxed under corporate income tax, is that uh, after taxation, the money stays into the company. So to give, it, to give the cash to shareholders, you must uh, distribute dividends, and those dividends will be taxed at a level of 30% uh, for the shareholders. So it's quite a difference was uh, when you set up a company 
and uh, the personal income tax because under the personal income tax you you may be taxed uh, a bit more well different rates but you get the money directly without uh, distributing dividends um <clears throat> Uh, the, the main uh, tax in France uh, that concerns most people is the personal income tax. Uh, the habit in France is to say that our taxes always change. People just forget that uh, this tax, the, the rules for this tax were established in 1917. It is in fact quite an old tax and the, the, the basic rules for uh, personal income tax are in fact very stable. <clears throat> so it is paid by physical persons only. Uh, it is uh, imposed on people who have their tax residence in France. There is no uh, relation with nationality. There is no mention of nationality. All people having their tax residence in France must declare their, uh, must produce a tax return for, corporate, for uh, personal income tax. Non-residents can be submitted to this uh, tax. In fact, especially if they have some real estate revenues in France. <clears throat> and so, yes, I've said there is no consideration of nationality. Uh, this tax could be considered as uh, very extensive, but in fact, only 40% of the population will pay for it. It is declared by everyone but only 40% of people pay it. It is a progressive tax. The rate go from zero to 45%. There are some steps at 11%, 30%, 41%. Uh, but in fact, it is a, yes, a progressive tax. So the first, the first part of your revenues is taxed to zero. Then the upper, then uh, an upper part will be taxed at uh, 11 and then 30, etc. For high revenues, there is a temporary contribution uh, of uh, three or 4% over this uh, personal income tax. It is temporary, so we don't know when it, will, uh, when it will end. It is temporary in the French way. It can last very, very long till the, can, uh, till the tax office doesn't need any money more. <laughs> It is about uh, 10 years old. I think it was, uh, it was established after the crisis of 2008. <clears throat> what is very different, important for personal decision tax, it is, it is determined by household. It is not determined by person. So what is an household? It is two, let's say adults, max, uh, who have a legal link. To be in the same household, you must be married or you must be uh, united with uh, a PAX, which is uh, a civil contract uh, between adults mm, next to the marriage. Of course, these two adults can be of the same gender. In uh, the household, you will add uh, so dependent children. So they need to be dependent of, uh, so they need to be children of one parent. In fact, only the, the children under 18 are automatically uh, members of this household. If uh, your children are between 18 and 25 years old, they must say, I want to be in the household with my parents. Uh, and uh, when they are between 21 and 25 years old, they must be students, in fact. Uh, it, uh, in fact, the children don't need to have the same address as their parents. So for example, you can be a resident in France, and have uh, your children being uh, students in uh, the USA, and uh, they will be a member of your household. Uh, <clears throat> what is important about the household is that uh, all the revenues inside the household will be totalized. So uh, I would say the revenues of the parents and the revenues of the children either. Uh, so, uh, and there is no deduction inside. Uh, if I take the example of someone having a child uh, being a student in the US, if you send him some uh, money, some pension, it is not deductible because it is inside his household. <clears throat> and so I have made a chart on the bottom right 
that shows the difference for the same revenue on the uh, on the orange line it is a tax paid by a single person and for the same revenue uh, on the blue line it is the tax paid by uh, let's say a family with two parents and two children so it has really really an impact on uh, on the taxes paid and uh, it is important for example to make simulations if uh, you have children above 18 to choose whether they are to be included or not in the household and the decision to include them or not can be changed every year <clears throat> the the basic rule uh, uh, you know in all taxes in France to define what is a taxable revenue is uh, to say it is the difference between the gross revenues less the expenses to get it or keep it. So the problem here is to say depending on the different sources, the possible sources of revenues, where does the information come from? If you have wages or pension, the, the sources uh, of information will be given by the employer or the, the, the social body uh, that pays the pension. If you have investment income, if you have capital gains, in most cases, the bank is, will give the information. Uh, if you have income from real property, you will need uh, you need only a simplified accounting. If you have business profits, uh, in fact, commercial profits, if you have non-commercial profits, that is, uh, for example, for, for doctors, for uh, architects or whatsoever, that's non-commercial profits. If you have agricultural profits, in all these cases, you need accounting books. So accounting books, you, you may need uh, a chartered accountant. It, uh, it's a cost. So if you have only a low activity, you have uh, some, some ways to declare uh, these revenues in a more simple way than maintaining a contact book. That's what we call the, the micro uh, systems. So you can be a micro entrepreneur, you can have some micro foncier revenues from real income, etc. cetera. Uh, there exists a, the, the, the basic rule for these micro systems is that you will declare only the, the gross revenue, the, your, your net income and uh, your turnover and um, with, there will be a percentage uh, of expenses that will be automatically applied. And the percentage depends on the activity. Uh, it can rise from 30% uh, to 71%. Uh, it is more simple, but uh, I must warn you that uh, administrative simplification doesn't mean that uh, it is a tax optimization. Because, <clears throat> for example, it doesn't mean you will pay less taxes. In fact, with those micro uh, systems, you will never have, for example, a deficit. As soon as you cash in one uh, euro, then you will pay some taxes, even though there is a, uh, a discount rate. Uh, maybe with accounting books, depending on your situation, maybe you can declare a deficit or a very limited uh, revenue. So. Simplification is not always a tax optimization. <clears throat> uh, on uh, what about the tax credits about, uh, so this personal income tax, there are quite a lot uh, tax credits. Most of them are related to, to real estate, but uh, one which is very accessible to everyone um, is uh, in fact employing someone at home. Uh, uh, that's the most common tax credit, and in fact, you can get a tax credit of fifty percent of the of the cost. And you can employ someone at, at home by uh, directly employing the person, or uh, you can, uh, I would say, buy hours, buy services to a licensed company, and this will be declared as a service at home. There are quite a vari variety of uh, the services uh, that are available for this tax credit. The most common are housekeeping or uh, guarding the children, that's gardening. 
but uh, the assistance to file a tax return from a chartered accountant can be considered as a, as a, a service at home. And so you, you can get uh, the tax credit with this kind of service. Um, <clears throat> just a global overview of uh, the taxation of uh, US revenues. So first, uh, there is a tax treaty that will say uh, for each type of revenue, if uh, the revenues are to be taxed in the US or in France, uh, depending uh, where they rise. Uh, the most common rule is that for real estate, it is always taxed in the country where the real estate uh, is. Real estate is very practical for a tax office because it doesn't move. So uh, all, uh, all tax office in the world want to tax, uh, want to tax the real estate of their country. Uh, for the other cases, your revenues, even in the US are to be declared in France and there will be uh, a calculated tax credit uh, to avoid taxation. This tax credit uh, will represent uh, the French or the American taxation. And so, in fact, you can't do without a computer. <laughs> it's uh, quite complicated. I wanted to give you just a word about, I would say, a hidden tax, which is the CSJ, which is Contribution Sociale Generalisée. It is, in fact, a tax to finance the social security system. It is quite hidden. You don't see if you get salaries. You, you don't see it because it is in the kind of social contributions. Uh, if you get some dividends, uh, communication is made around a rate with a rate of 30%. And, but in this rate of 30%, more than the 17.5%, than 20%, 17.20% are in fact uh, CSG to finance the social security system. And if you get for example, some real estate revenues in France, you will have your tax notice for personal income tax plus a tax notice for, um, for CSG. And when we have spoken, for example, of uh, rates for the, for the personal income tax going from zero to 45%, this was before CSG. So even though you pay zero, uh, for personal income tax, you may pay 17.5% of uh, taxes just for your real estate revenues, if you have some. Okay, <clears throat> so it is not to be ignored. We have a wealth tax in France, so it is called impôt sur la fortune immobilière, which means so tax on real estate uh, wealth. So formerly it was a tax on uh, on the complete wealth of a person. Uh, from uh, 2017, it has turned into a tax only on real estate. Uh, it is based on the market value of your real estate. And, uh, uh, and you must include the values of companies where real estate is more than 50% of the assets, okay, for the, for the value of the real estate assets. The tax begins, it is applicable only if your real estate is worth more than 1.3 million euros. What uh, the extent of the real estate considered for the residents in France, it is the real estate worldwide. Okay. And uh, for non-residents, it is the real estate in France. Um, <clears throat> your in fact, your assets will be diminished by the loans you can have on these assets. So it is, uh, the, as I said before, the rule is that uh, you make the difference between the gross revenue and uh, or, or here the gross capital and uh, the expenses you need to get it. So the loans will diminish your, uh, your, your assets. The rates are from 0.5% to 1.5%, but that's every year. 1.5% is, uh, is when your wealth, your real estate wealth is uh, greater than 10 million euros. So what we say usually is we say the, the usual rate is uh, 1%. And so if you have a wealth tax paid in the USA, it can come 
uh, it can be considered as a tax credit. The, the rule is always to avoid a double taxation between France and the US. Uh, what uh, impo what uh, a nice scheme I, I wanted to tell you about is the impatriate scheme. If, uh, if you have a company and you want to recruit a manager coming from abroad, um, there is a special scheme for that. So the condition is that the, the person you, you target is, has not uh, had his residency in France for the last, for the last five years. But in your employment contract, you will identify, I would say, as a salary corresponding to the competence of the people and the usual rate paid for this type of competence and work. And you can identify an impatriation pre premium, something that you will pay to the worker so that he comes to France. And this premium will not be taxed for eight years under the personal income tax rules. And uh, for uh, five years, I think, uh, yes, for, that's for five years, considering the, the, wealth, uh, the wealth tax on real estate, the rules for non-residents will apply. So only the real estate in France will be considered for this, uh, for this tax. I, uh, I have finished on this point. Uh, I have made it... Uh, of course, I could speak far much longer about French taxes. I uh, wanted only to point the, the most uh, important uh, items. And, uh, and here I am. And now I think I'll give uh, back the microphone to Duran so that we, we can create the Q&A. Thank you very, very much for that overview. So now we get to the fun part, right? So Q&A. Uh, again, uh, apologies, but I'm going to start. We had like over 200 RSVPs and we had at least 100 questions, so we couldn't do every one. I apologize in advance. The first one we got is an assurance vie is good estate planning tool in France. However, it is unclear how an assurance vie in euros is viewed or treated by the IRS. Your views, please. We had a long conversation, Hervé and I, about this one. The thing is that an assurance V is not a standard product. So you can't make any sweeping statements uh, around it. Although uh, we have seen people do it in online forums, but you know these people aren't qualified. They can say what they like. So for us as qualified professionals, we need to see the contract. We need to understand what the product, how the product is constructed. And that is uh, to see whether I know where people have a problem. This is where some of these investment or pension or insurance products are treated as PFIX from a US perspective. So for those who are not familiar, just quickly touch on what a PFIC is, a passive foreign investment company. And it is a regime that was created in the 1980s because US domestic financial institutions were complaining that Americans who invested abroad got a tax advantage in some of the products that they were investing in, uh, an unfair advantage. So to try not just to equalize the playing field, but basically to penalize you. And I'm going to be honest, right? It is to penalize U.S. exposed persons who invest in certain financial products outside of the U.S. So yes, the, the PFIC regime does apply in some circumstances to the assurance fee. So again, you need to speak with your consulting team and they will interpret it and uh, they'll be able to defend the interpretation. Each one is, is, is could be slightly nuanced and different. Uh, next question for you, uh, Hervé. The US stimulus payments, we, talk, we spoke about three rounds of payments. How are they viewed from a French tax perspective? Um... The stimulus payment, in fact, I didn't know this came, so... Um, when we discussed it... I, I don't know so much. When we discussed it earlier and we went into the mechanics of it, you mentioned mm -hmm. that all income will be reportable and therefore it will be taxable, potentially, in, in France. Uh, 
Yes, but in fact, it, the stimulus payment is what you got in the last year due to COVID, etc. No, not only right. So there were two stimulus payments in 2020, and there so far there's been one in 2021. And they are accessible to people not being resident in the U.S. Absolutely, wherever yeah. in the world you reside. Yeah. Mm. Um, we will cut the microphones. Don't declare them. I, I don't see uh, how the tax office in France could 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 uh, follow that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, honestly, um, ju just be the tax office in France has a very bad reputation. But um, in fact, uh, they know what controlling cost. So they won't come for, they won't come for you or to you for 5,000 euros. I don't think, I don't think. Okay. Or, or the penalty would be 10%. Uh, just let uh, 500 euros and go uh, and work and serve your clients. Understood. So it depends <laughs> on your risk, your, your risk yeah. tolerance. Okay, yeah. gotcha. So next question, uh, as US expats retired living in, uh, living in France, so therefore French tax residents, my spouse and I are subject to French gift tax for any cash gifts provided to non-family members. Uh, we have no kids, <clears throat> blah, 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 yeah. blah. So basically gifts to non-French residents. Is there uh, a way to do that in a tax efficient way? Uh, the, the, the French system won't consider the nationality. If you give uh, uh, some money to someone who is not uh, of your family, it will be taxed under 60%. There are some small allowances, uh, but in fact, they are linked to, with the habit. If uh, you earn a lot, you can give a lot. If you earn very small, you, you mustn't, in fact, put your patrimony in danger. So uh, do what you wish. Uh, um, uh, be reasonable, I would say. Only, only okay. that. Uh, in this question, there was a second part in the question, which was very interesting because it's, uh, if I remember, the the person was saying, "I want to to give to some U.S. charities." I live in France, but I want I want to to give to the U.S. charities. Uh, what is important to know is that. You can give freely to a charity, but this charity must be declared in France. And so my, uh, I have had the case with some, uh, an Australian uh, case. Um, uh, the, the, Australian, uh, the, the Australian Navy in France had given to the um, Salvation Army in Australia. Salvation Army in Australia is not a charity under the French law. So give to the uh, Salvation Army International, and that then it can be a, a, a French charity or an international charity, and so there will be no tax. But if you give to the U.S. Salvation Army, then it is a sixty percent tax. Right, which again is similar to the U.S. In the U, for mm. it to be deductible in the U.S., it needs to be a U.S. qualified charity, even though it's mm. recognized in another jurisdiction. It must be in the U.S. So I guess it's pretty consistent. Next, next one. Uh, blah blah blah. I'm dual, both American and French nationality, and I'm a 50% owner of a French company, uh, an SAS, since 2018. Okay, so they're providing a service, and they're doing it um, uh, online. So there's no tangible, there's no physical product. So what they're asking about, and we discussed this earlier, the VAT. If it is that they, they, they come, they're using uh, an entity that's outside of, of France, do they have to use, do, do they have to add VAT to that? Yeah. Uh, in fact, under the, the, the US uh, French tax convention, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a, uh, you must define where you have a, a stable establishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in this country where you have a stable establishment, you must make uh, accounting books for this activity in this country. 
So the, the problem is to determine whether you have a, a, fixed, uh, a fixed activity, a fixed establishment in France or not. If you have a fixed establishment in France and uh, you sell a service to the USA, then you will have to put survey, you have to, to tax uh, it under VAT 20% because in fact the service is produced in France. Okay, and that covers quite a number of people ask that whether there's any tax advantage to using a company outside of uh, outside of France to do mm. business. But to, to just to reinforce your point, and this answers like 20 questions that were asked. Uh, yeah, if it I'm is you are based in France, yeah. Go ahead, just finish. remember, just to remember two things. First, VAT taxes operations, not structures. So mm -hmm. if you are an independent or a company, it doesn't matter at all. The, the problem is what are the operations you make? Secondly, on all our towns or in France, it is retail equality. So uh, the taxes don't depend so much on whether you do your activity as an individual or as a company or whatsoever. You do it, as a, the objective is that people are quite uh, taxed the same way for uh, the activities they have. If they have the same revenues, they will be taxed the same way. About Perfect. Hundreds. Okay, ne next question. I reside in France, pay personal income tax in France, up to date US. Okay, so they have a company, and I guess this is for uh, a US perspective. They have a company in France, the company's bank account will be included in the F bars, but the company also has to file, uh, Has you need to report the existence of the company on a form 5471, which forms part of your tax return. So even though it's a company, so it's separate in law from you, once you, you have a share in that company above a certain threshold, uh, it, it's the lowest threshold is 10%, you need to report the activities like the financials of that company as part of your personal US tax returns. And if you have signing authority over the bank accounts for that company, it must also be reported on, on your personal life bars as well. Uh, moving on quickly, uh, someone is asking the same question. Again, they have a company outside of France. It offers no advantage once everything is being done in France. Next question, uh, stimulus checks, that was answered as well. Next question, as a dual citizen, what is the best way to work as an independent consultant? Do I set up an LLC in the US and build clients via that entity or create a French société like uh, Sasu or Auto Entrepreneur? Uh, we, that you, we discussed that from the, the French point of view. Um, he's, uh, he or she has asked what are the tax implications uh, from a US perspective as well. So both sides, we've discussed the French side. Uh, as mentioned from the US side, you need to report the existence if it's an incorporated entity. It will be on the 5471. If it is uh, an auto entrepreneur, it'll just be on your Schedule C. They're asking about CFC and guilty. So for those who are not familiar with it, CFC are control foreign corp rules. So if you have an entity outside of the US and it's more than 50% owned and or controlled by US exposed persons, it's considered a control foreign corp and there's certain CFC rules that kick in. Uh, and one of them is the guilty rule, which is the global intangible low tax income tax. Now the, the guilty as of last year, there's a high tax exempt, uh, exemption. So guilty and CFC rules basically work to prevent you from deferring paying taxes. So even though you don't take all the, the profits from the company out in terms of a bonus or in terms of, you know, some sort of uh, yeah, distribution to yourself, you are, from a U.S. point of view, you're deemed to have done so. So in other words, you're paying tax on phantom earnings. So that creates some sort of cash flow issues because you need to pay tax on that company's earnings, even though you didn't constructively receive them. Now, the guilty rule in particular, as the name suggests, it's for low tax. So if it is you have the, the French corporate structure, which Hervé mentioned is taxed at 15%, 1.5, then yes, guilty may kick in. But if you have one of the other structures, which is taxed at above the, the threshold is around 19%, then no, you do not need to work, uh, worry about guilty. So just to cut to the chase, if, if it is that you don't understand the nuances of it, it's worth having a conversation with someone or who understands both 
to make sure that you pick something that works for you, right? Next question, who or what is subject to guilty tax in filing form 5471? Uh, mentioned that already. Guilty would be if you have a corporate structure where the, the tax rate is considered to be low by US standards, the guilty tax will kick in to make sure that you don't enjoy a tax benefit by having a company outside of the US. Form 5471, we already mentioned any in interest. This could be value of voice. So this includes those who use nominees value of voice that's more than uh, that's 10 percent or more next question uh this one is for you Erve. as an auto entrepreneur can i hire and pay subcontractors for work can i hire services in the u.s can i have clients in the u.s outside of france as i said as an auto entrepreneur you will use a simplified way of taxation you will declare only your net income so if uh, you can do what you wish, uh, you can take subcontractors, etc. But you won't be able to to diminish your your tax due to your expenses. So it's really not a nonsense. Sorry to say that uh, mm -hmm. like that. If you are an entrepreneur, it is it is for beginning a small activity just to taste it, etc. At the beginning, your entrepreneur was only a temporary status. So the. Mm -hmm. it, not made at all to make expenses. Understood. So someone else is asking about uh, declaring their bank accounts. Uh, basically, if you have bank accounts outside of the US uh, that exceed a certain threshold, then it triggers the foreign bank account report, otherwise known as FBARS or FinCEN uh, 114. If it is that you have been negligent and you did not file them as in the case in this question, you should disclose them under what is called the streamlined compliance procedure, which is an amnesty in all but name. It allows you to go back and retroactively make certain disclosures and file certain tax returns. And in return for voluntarily coming forward, the IRS would agree typically not to pursue civil and criminal penalties. So this is for those whose non-compliance is deemed to be non-willful. So they did not intentionally set about to evade taxes. So it's, it's something to consider and you, can, and you can speak to your advisors about that. There's a follow-up question from this person. What are the chances that the situation will get better in the future? I know there are people who peddle uh, what I believe, I'm being honest, false hope. It, you know, it just is not on the legislative agenda for Congress to consider U.S. persons outside of the U.S. So those people who peddle the idea that at some point in time FATCA will be repealed or we'll go to territorial tax or whatever the case may be, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, you can just look at the behavior of Congress. And then when you look internationally, the opposite is happening. Where you seeing certain countries around the world, including especially European countries, who seem to be leaning in the direction of the U.S., where they're seeking to tax citizens their own citizens who no longer reside domestically and it is definitely the case with canada the uk australia new zealand already and certain european countries so the us is not going to backpedal in fact other countries are going to catch up and when it comes when you deal with the history of tax you'd see that the us is actually the leader when it comes to certain policies like transfer pricing and taxes and digital services and, and stuff like that so moving on uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, the, okay, so this, we've got quite a few questions on, on the French social security uh, system. So people who pay into French social security in order to avoid, legally avoid having to pay into US social security as well. They need to get some sort of document from your staff or CAPM. Could you comment on that, Hervé? Mm -hmm. uh, it is sure that uh, you will have the uh, international rules. You will have only to, to pay for one social security system because uh, you, will be, you will be only in one hospital at a time. Uh, so uh, send me an email and uh, I, will, uh, and I will answer you uh, by email to, to tell you on which website to go to, to get an answer. Okay, that's great. And Irvi, so those who are watching on the live stream, 
uh, just leave a comment and we'll come back to you. For those on, on Zoom, if you look in the box at the bottom, you will see Hervé's email uh, address that you can reach out to him directly. Uh, someone else asked about other French investment products like the OPCVM and, you know, again, about the Asturance V and Perco. So basically from a US perspective to answer all of those, any US tax professional would need to see the contracts and to understand how it's structured, to see whether from a US perspective, it's self-directed and therefore tax transparent and it could be a PFIC or whether it is not transparent and whether the wrapper would hold. So we, a US person, any US tax professional would need to see it. So it's on a case by case basis. The last question, because we are already at the top of the hour for Irving, can I be the beneficiary of a, a trust in the US, even though I'm a tax resident of France? And what are the implications of yeah. that, Irving? Uh, so the, the French law doesn't know what a trust is. So uh, you can be the beneficiary, you can be uh, an administrator, doesn't matter at all. There will be no directly tax on it. But uh, France likes to know who owns real estate in France. So first, if you are a member, whatever your position, if you are a member of a trust, in fact, the administrator of the trust, if there is a French tax resident, must declare the trust to the French authorities. Uh, and then every year, is a, uh, the, the administrator must declare what are the revenues on real estate, on real estate owned by the trust in, uh, for some real estate in France. So uh, it's really uh, not much. I have not seen a lot of examples, but just remember you, as a French tax resident, you, the administrator must declare the, must declare the trust uh, to the French authorities. Right. And, convert uh, and, and if you get, sorry, if you get some revenues from the trust, then they are to be uh, put in your tax uh, return uh, in the places uh, where, where they need to be. If it is capital gains on, uh, on uh, real estate, it is uh, to be placed at the time, or if it is interest, etc., it will be in the interest. Okay. There is no special uh, field for that. Okay, great. I apologize. We have not even touched on half the questions. The response has been overwhelming, which means clearly there's a, a demand for, for proper advice. So Irvin and I will, we will uh, speak to each other and we will run this again. And for those who did not get their questions answered or discussed, we will endeavor to do so at the next occasion. Uh, merci beaucoup à tous. Très bonne soirée à tous. Here are four ways we can help you. Number one, sign up for free webinars on U.S. Expat Taxes and International Entrepreneur Taxes at www.htj.tax. Number two, stream premium educational videos at www.htj.tax. Number three, contact us for tax optimization consult over Zoom. Number four, high net worth. We can quote for doing your U.S. international taxes returns. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.tax. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Email us at help at htj.tax to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.